I'm Dr. Arthur Fleischer, Chief of Ultrasound at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Nashville, Tennessee. This presentation will cover the various sonographic techniques, including transvaginal sonography, 3D, color Doppler sonography, and mention the use of contrast in the evaluation of patients with pelvic masses. This presentation will cover the application of various sonographic techniques in evaluating patients with pelvic masses. Uh, Transabdominal sonography is used for a survey of the pelvis and in some cases can display images better than transvaginal. Transvaginal sonography allows us to see masses in detail, color Doppler lets us depict the vascularity. 3D evaluates the morphology and live 3D is a new technique which allows us to see the morphology of lesions. And I'll just mention, although it's not FDA approved, the application of contrast for evaluating uh, patients with pelvic masses. I'm going to emphasize the clinically important parameters in uh, evaluation of patients with pelvic masses, optimizing the use of these various techniques, and give you some examples. The clinically important questions are, is it benign or potentially malignant? Is it torsed? Is it persistent or transitory? Does it require immediate surgery or medical treatment? And if surgery is indicated, can it be performed laparoscopically? And these are all questions that need to be answered with ultrasound. Transvaginal sonography allows us to see detailed images of the adnexal structures, but color Doppler adds a lot of information concerning the vascularity of the lesion and its potential malignancy. Transabdominal provides a survey, an overview, Transvaginal allows us to see details. Color Doppler, as I mentioned, evaluates the vascularity and the integrity of the vascularity. 3D allows us to see spatial relationships. In evaluating patients with pelvic masses, one needs to determine the organ of origin, whether it's uterine, ovarian, tubal, or other, such as related to bowel whether the morphology is totally cystic, complex meaning containing cystic and solid areas or solid, whether the internal consistency is completely anechoic or fluid, whether there are septations or papillary excrescences. And finally, sonography should detect whether there's ascites, metastatic disease, or pelvocalyectasis. Now, I'm going to de-emphasize the evaluation of cystic masses because this is relatively straightforward. We need to determine whether it's a physiologic cyst, whether indeed is related to the ovary or outside the ovary, such as para-ovarian cysts, and realize that some completely cystic masses can in fact be epithelial tumors. This Netter diagram shows the uh, group of cystic lesions that we can study using sonography and depending on where the ovulatory disorder occurs we can have a follicular cyst or a corpus luteum or a luteal cyst if the hemorrhage has undergone fibrinolysis for example this is an example of a polycystic ovary with multiple immature follicles and thickened stroma, or whether or not there in fact is some leakage of hemorrhage in a hemorrhagic cyst. Now, this is a very nice example, straightforward, of a normal ovary with a mature follicle and several immature follicles. This on the other hand is a hemorrhagic cyst there's echogenic intraperitoneal fluid, 
On color, we can see the vascularity to this ovary, so we know it's not torsed, and we can see significant intraperitoneal fluid. In fact, when we watch this on cine loop, we can see that the fluid moves around. It uh, goes back and forth. We can see the ovary, and in fact, we can see uh, the fimbriated end of the tube, as uh, we'll see here. And we know that this is uh, fluid related to a hemorrhagic cyst. This being the fimbriated end of the tube. In postmenopausal women, it's not uncommon to see a smooth wall cysts less than three centimeters, and these are probably inclusion cysts. Now, in a study which was done many years ago in follow-up of patients with greater that or less than five centimeter cysts, you could see that some of these, in fact, disappeared in postmenopausal women. Some of them enlarged, and some of them got uh, bigger. In a larger study from Scandinavia, you can see that whether or not the cysts regress is related to age, with the younger patient having the more likelihood that uh, cysts would regress. Now, the variation of cystic masses that we need to be concerned about are shown here, ones with septations or papillary excrescences. These are typically epithelial tumors, dermoids, and we need to keep in the back of our mind that there's a variety of uh, masses that have echogenic fluid in them, and that's dermoids, endometrioma, sometimes in mucinous tumors, and in patients with hemorrhage. The findings of malignancy are shown here, papillary excrescences. Only 50%, uh, however, will be truly malignant. Some of these are borderline tumor, but thickened and irregular walls and clustered vessels on color are certainly uh, findings suggestive of malignancy as well as ascites. Now, um, this diagram shows very nicely what papillary excrescences look like. These are clusters of cells that grow into the center of the lesion and, in fact, can grow on the outside of the lesion. In these areas, there's abnormal proliferation of cells. Now, typically, unilocular cysts are almost always benign. However, ones with papillary projections, at least half of these, will in fact be malignant. And here's some examples of small papillary projections. In this lesion, there's a small papillary projection along this wall, which has no increased vascularity associated with it. This, on the other hand, is a more complex lesion with large papillary excrescences and very abnormal vessels in this uh, ovarian cancer. And as you can see here, some of the vessels have very low impedance flow. This is another example of papillary cancer. And you can see on this uh, group of images the papillary projections. On 3D, we can see in this lesion some of the papillary projections beautifully. And here is a vessel going to this papillary projection. And as you can see, the blood flow in the, in the uh, papillary projection has very low impedance. Complex lesions are uh, a group that can mimic each other, hemorrhagic cysts, endometriomas, dermoids, tube ovarian abscesses. And um, dermoids uh, can have echogenic areas due to sebum. Um, they can have teeth, calcification, and of course hair follicles. Now the more solid these are, the more likelihood that they indeed are malignant. As shown on the bottom of this image, this is a malignant uh, teratoma. Endometriomas are typically these so-called powder burn lesions that occur on the surface of the ovary, or uh, as shown here, or the uterus. Uh, 
or bowel. The most common place for them to implant is in the uterosacral ligament. When they grow, you, they can become so-called chocolate cysts. Now a tubo ovarian abscess typically evolves from a corpus luteum that has become infected and as you can see here multiple adhesions can form. In this patient we have uh, a echogenic mass shown here, a cystic mass, um, and a lesion with some thin fibrin strands. So this patient has a large dermoid, a smooth walled cyst, and a hemorrhagic lesion. And when we do color, we can see that these lesions, these interfaces, in fact, have little or no uh, vascularity. Here we have a lesion that has uh, no internal vascularity, and um, we can see that uh, this is a uniformly echogenic lesion. Endometriomas may have the so-called ground glass appearance, as we can see in this image, of uh, clotted blood. Tubo ovarian complex, the tube has endosalpingeal folds, as we can see here, as little uh, projections into what is a distended uh, tube. Endometriomas can have echogenic foci, as, as one can see here, and uh, these are uh, areas of hemosiderin and cholesterol deposits due to breakdown products. And here is the Doppler of that uh, lesion. Um, sometimes there can be some increased flow around it due to fibrosis. Uh, this is a hemorrhagic lesion that has undergone torsion and there in fact is no blood flow uh, to this torsed ovary. This is an appearance of a dermoid cyst with an echogenic area related to sebum and some uh, vascularity surrounding it. And here is the uh, blood flow. This is a, a ruptured cyst with a surrounding solid hematoma. Um, this is kind of uh, homogeneous and this pattern of course is nonspecific but is typical of a resolving hematoma. This is a lesion that has multiple locules within it, and as you can see, uh, areas of increased blood flow in the center of the lesion. And on 3D color Doppler, you can actually see the vessels and their surrounding um, uh, normal tissue and the small locules of pus. And we'll see this on the uh, 3D video, which I'll show you um, later in this talk showing the increased vascularity inside this tube over an abscess. Solid lesions are typically fibroids or metastatic lesions to the ovary or in some cases teratomas. This is a picture of a uh, adenocarcinoma of the ovary that's a solid uh, lesion. This is a color Doppler showing an area that is solid arising from the left ovary in this patient with colon cancer, which was a metastatic tumor with very low impedance blood flow. Um, and this is the right ovary in the same patient with bilateral ovarian uh, metastases. This is a patient that has a solid lesion with some cystic spaces, and this is a germ cell tumor. Most ovarian cancers are of epithelial origin, only a few percent are related to germ cells. And this is an example of this, a very complex solid tumor with low impedance type flow. Now one can quantitate the vascular index, and as you can see from these graphs, our experience is that um, malignancies have greater vascularity, uh, but there is some statistical overlap. So the sonographic differential diagnosis uh, depends on its location, consistency, and vascularity, and you really need to know the clinical setting to give the best differential diagnosis. You can improve your specificity by using color Doppler, and um, I will show you some examples of that. This is the result of a large study in Europe 
where they came up with so-called rules for diagnosing ovarian cancer. Basically, cysts that are unilocular with little or no solid components uh, and no blood flow are, are typically benign, whereas malignancies were irregular, had ascites, papillary excrescences, and irregular multilocular uh, lesions with high color content. And with this differential, they could have a 90 plus percent sensitivity and specificity. 3D color Doppler or 3D in general is very, very helpful in gynecology. It allows us to see um, better the pelvic mass as well as uterine disorders and the vascularity. As you can see, uh, some probes are simple mechanical sectors that scan through an area of interest and build up a 3D image from multiplanar reconstruction. And this is an example of multiplanar reconstruction of this cystic lesion, as you can see here in the long axis, in the orthogonal plane, and in the coronal axis, and in the sample volume, um, that this is a simple cyst with thin walls. This is a lesion that has very thin uh, fibrin strands, as we can see, um, as a, a sign of uh, benignancy. This lesion, on the other hand, has more solid and irregular areas, but had no blood flow in the center of this and is typical of a hemorrhagic cyst. This is a very nice image of a 3D uh, depiction of papillary excrescences within an ovarian cancer. Now, there is a, a new probe that is a so-called live 3D or matrix array probe. It consists of multiple elements and allows uh, live 3D. I'll show you an example um, of a pelvic mass. This is just the typical image um, of the liver with a matrix array probe. You can see uh, the scan plane is selectable. The sample volume is continually updated so that um, one can uh, image in any particular plane. Here we're going uh, down in, into different levels in the liver. This is an image sent to me by Dr. Wen Chen from Peking, and this is an ovarian uh, mucinous tumor. And as you can see here in 3D, we've color-coded the sepia or, yellow, or orange is closer, the blue is further away. And uh, we can see beautifully the internal septations in this ovarian tumor uh, using this 4D technology. Now I'd like to show you how 3D color Doppler can be applied. It allows us better determination of location, organ of origin, uh, allows us to serially evaluate fibroids, uterine malformations, and tubal disorders. And this can be obtained by using a freehand, which is not used that much anymore, but with automated scanning, the volume that is rendered uh, can be evaluated by looking in different scan planes. And this is an example of an ovarian cancer. In this plane we can see the tumor here in this combined grayscale and 3D color Doppler we can see abnormal vessels in the area of the tumor. We can see in this plane the internal vessels that are shown uh, very nicely on this image. I'm going to show a uh, videotape of some of the um, cases that we've seen with 3D color. This is a endometrioma with kind of diffuse echogenic uh, content. What we're doing first is 
scanning throughout the plane and seeing uh, areas of vascularity. Here on this 3D volume, we're seeing that there are only a few vessels in the periphery of this lesion. None of them, in fact, are coursing toward the center of the lesion. So this is an example of a benign uh, lesion. This is in the other scan plane. And I'll show you the next case, which shows uh, abnormal vessels coursing toward the center of the lesion. Uh, this is another 3D color Doppler done transabdominally with a freehand technique. We're imaging through the ovary here. We're finding an echogenic papillary area. And uh, we can see that there's a small vessel going to it. When we post-process this um, image, we can see that uh, there's a large vessel going to the area of abnormality uh, right here, which uh, supplies the ovarian cancer. Uh, 3D is very helpful in evaluating tubal disorders, as I mentioned. This is a, a 3D image moving in all scan planes, showing that this tubular structure seen in the long axis, short axis, and the coronal plane is uh, arising from the corneal area of the uterus. And the 3D scan plane, uh, again, confirms that this indeed is a hydrosalpinx as opposed to a cystic ovarian lesion uh, using 3D. This is an intramural fibroid with peripheral vascularity. Uh, this is prior to embolization. And one can uh, see that as opposed to an adenomyosis where the vessels are diffuse, um, this uh, lesion has a peripheral vascularity. I'll show you some of the uh, vessels supplying this fibroid. We're going to select uh, some of these scan planes to show. This shows the significant amount of vascularity all surrounding this fibroid. This is the combined sample volume showing the large peripheral vessel supplying this fibroid. We can take this sample volume. We can move it in any particular scan orientation. We can slice and dice it, and we can evaluate its overall vascularity uh, very nicely using this 3D uh, technique. Here we're just showing the sample volume and the vascularity surrounding this fibroid. We can remove the grayscale and look at the vascular tree. And we can follow many patients that have had uterine fibroid embolization um, and may have complications after that for the overall vascularity. And here we'll take off the grayscale and show you the vascular network surrounding this fibroid. 
then we can put back the color Doppler. This is an example of an endometrial polyp and the vascularity in the endometrial polyp that was a malignant polyp. And I hope you can appreciate the vessels being very abnormal. There's areas of dilatation and narrowing and there's abnormal branching inside of this polyp and we can appreciate this because we can have a display in 3D uh, of this vascularity inside of this polyp. This is a patient that had uh, a lesion in the ovary and the 3D was very helpful in showing the central location of the vessels as opposed to a benign lesion. Uh, here we have again a mostly solid lesion with some cystic spaces and all of the vessels here are shown to be abnormal. Um, supplying the center of the tumor. Here are the multiplanar images that were obtained and again we can see that the vessels course toward the center of the lesion right here. This is in the coronal plane showing the location of these abnormal vessels. This is the sample volume where we can see the relationship of the vessels to the morphologic abnormality. These are all abnormal vessels in the area of thickening inside of this lesion. And this is the vascular cast image of these abnormal vessels. This is the lesion that I showed on the earlier portion of the talk. This is a large tube over an abscess. And here are the abnormal vessels. And we can see the 3D volume here. Um, I was asked to aspirate this lesion, but I wanted to show them the vessels that may be traversed and this 3D was very helpful to convince them not to 
uh, pursue aspiration of these lesions. And here we cut the top of the lesion bloodlessly, I must add, that uh, then we take the volume and tip it and we can look into the lesion and we can see that um, yes I could aspirate a, a few of these small locules but the needle would be traversing all the vessels inside of this tube over an abscess and that would not be a great idea uh, to perform it. So um, it's very helpful in identifying the proper route for placement of needles and aspiration. Here we're putting back the tissue that we removed. This is a 3D image. Um, as I mentioned briefly, uh, we can use fluid in the lumen and we can identify beautifully the polyp and its vascularity. As we can see here, the vessels inside of this polyp are seen um, and are better seen with 3D representation. So the polyp and its vascularity are seen very nicely with this technique. Three D allows us to see the vessel arrangement. The the density may correlate to histology. And finally, uh, I want to show you some examples of contrast to depict. Uh, perfusion. We can also with 3D technique uh, determine vessel density and morphology because as I said tumors have microaneurysm, stenosis, and blind ending pouches. And we can look at vessel branching patterns. Now these parameters have been quantitated using the vascularization index, the flow index, which takes into account the amplitude and a combination of the vascular flow index. Here is a very vascular tumor as you can see here. This is another very vascular tumor with some internal vessels and this cine loop also shows a relatively hypovascular cystadenoma. With 3D sonography uh, we can identify these branching patterns and determine the relative vascular density. There's been one study which has shown that this data helps reduce the false positive rate in diagnosing uh, malignancies. Finally, I want to just briefly mention the use of contrast. With tumors, one really needs to look at the capillary blood flow. Tumors have areas of increased interstitial pressure due to necrosis. Uh, this is a beautiful scanning electron micrograph of uh, the difference between the vascularity of normal with an art artery going to an arterial, going to a capillary, going to a venial versus on the opposite side a very tangled vessel uh, with very abnormal branching patterns. So what the microbubbles do is that they course in the circulation. They're about a third the size of a red blood cell. And they allow us to see vessels as small as capillaries. We use pulse inversion uh, techniques. And here's an example of a lesion that is about two centimeters with a slightly thickened area.
uh, the contrast is injected intravenously and the image that is uh, built up is shown here. This is the microvascular, which is the persistence image. And one could see that there was no increased vascularity in the wall of this morphologically suspect um, benign lesion. And we can quantitate the blood flow that we see with contrast using um, the following parameters. We can look at the time to peak, the peak intensity, and the washout phase, and basically the area under the curve. And when we do that, we can see that this benign lesion has a very quick uptake, a relatively small peak, and a quick washout phase. Contrast that, this is the 3D of this paraovarian cyst with uh, some vessels. And contrast that with this uh, cancer that I'll show you now. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, this is a benign lesion. This is a solid lesion that was suspect for cancer. But as you can see here with the contrast, we see very little, if any, blood flow in the center of this lesion. This was a fibroma. We'll see that the ovarian cancers, in fact, have significant enhancement. But this lesion, although it was suspect for cancer, uh, had very little or no vascularity. And here's the time activity curve. You see a very quick uptake and a very quick washout phase. Now watch the contrast in this ovarian cancer. This is a two centimeter ovary with a one centimeter cystic area. Watch the microbubbles as they come in and fill. There's a very large enhancement And we can see from the time activity curve a very high peak intensity and a very long washout phase. This is in the other ovary. And again, watch the marked enhancement of this lesion. This was also an ovarian cancer. And you can also see from this time activity curve that there's a very long washout phase. Now when we compare benign from malignant, we can see that there's no change in the wash-in phase, but on the maximum enhancement or the peak, there's a significant difference. On the washout phase, there's also a very significant difference. And finally, the area under the curve is significantly different. So what I've tried to do in this talk is give an overview of the use of various sonographic techniques in evaluating patients with pelvic masses, emphasizing the use of transabdominal to look at the global depiction, transvaginal to get the details, color Doppler to look at the vascularity, and 3D to look at morphology and volumetric changes, and finally the uh, potential use of contrast for evaluating uh, tumor enhancement and response. Thank you.